Hey there, in this video I take you behind the scenes of the Rustic Songbird podcast where I interview Sean Williams about how to pitch your songs for TV. So I hope you enjoy this episode and this interview. There's a lot of great insight and wisdom. I want to encourage you to check out the rest of the podcast. If you're interested in this episode, there's a whole bunch more. You can check out rusticsongbird.com forward slash podcast for a whole list of the previous episodes where I interview songwriters and people in the music industry about their process and it helps you to take your music to the next level. Also, I have a free class that I want to invite you to called The Three Secrets to Planning a Successful Album Release. So if you're planning to put music out into the world this year, I want to help you make that happen. To sign up for this free class, go to rusticsongbird.com forward slash register. I'll see you in the class. My guest on the show today is Sean Williams, and we're going to be talking all about how to pitch your songs with the intention of pitching to TV shows, for sync licensing, how to get your music on TV. And this is such a cool topic. I'm excited to talk about it and just kind of hear from your experience. So welcome to the show, Sean. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited. This is my passion. So. Yeah, well, mine too. And so I could nerd out about songwriting and making music all day long and talk about like the ins and outs of it. And so I started a podcast for that reason. That's like, awesome. Let's talk yeah. about it. And I met you, Sean, through our mutual friend, Evan Sealing, and he's been on the show before. We talked about how to record in a studio and how to prepare for that. Mm -hmm. And so today we're kind of uh, taking it in a different direction, talking about how you intentionally write the songs to be pitched and a lot of people write songs for radio or they write it to pitch to an artist to cut to an album and so there's a lot of intention in that like for example if i was writing to pitch to an artist i would think well what key is good for them to sing in and what style do they sing in and mm -hmm. what topics would they probably put on their album and so there's a lot of intention in the writing process and so i'd like to hear a little bit of your story of how you got into this and then we'll talk about more of the process of like actually making the music and actually pitching it once it's created. So yeah. tell me a little bit about your story, how you got into playing music as an instrumentalist and a music composer. Yeah, so um, came to Nashville in 2019 uh, as a violinist. So I came, studied at Belmont University, was pumped to go on tour with every big country artist. And for me, um, yeah, faith has always been a part of my musical journey as well. And um, yeah, just really felt called to Nashville. Um, Post-college, I ended up getting to tour with a couple bigger artists. Um, yeah, and it was just interesting, that whole lifestyle of being on the road. And I always have wanted to start a family and stuff. So I ended up transitioning to more artist production and uh, composition. And uh, kind of my first entrance into that was writing for this company out in LA, APM Music. Um, one of my buddies moved from Nashville out there and ended up having, um, he kind of took over this like custom division. Um, so they were doing like big placements and stuff, but he had a few projects that were smaller where they were looking for composers to kind of write instrumental music. Um, it would go in this library. And um, yeah, that process of like getting a directive that's like, you have to kind of paint this picture. There's no words musically just depict what you're, you're feeling and hearing. Um, yeah, I just kind of fell in love with that. Um, I forget how long ago it was, probably like four or five years, but um, I ended up getting connected with Musicbed. They're a big licensing company in um, Texas. And so I've been on there for yeah like four or five years and it's been amazing just the doors that have opened up kind of through being a part of that community and seeing my songs used in like random wedding videos all the way to like forward advertisements and stuff, so. Yeah. yeah, so cool. I, I love how uh, we were just talking about this before we got started, how instrumental music is like a work of art. If you're looking at a painting and you're not sure exactly what it is, or maybe the artist didn't even explain what they saw mm -hmm. in it, then each person takes something different out of it. And yep. so instrumental music can be used for like weddings or a commercial or yep. something, you know, like a myriad of different cinematic things um, that are depicting emotions. And so- Yeah, I really like that painting thing. reference, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's the visual version of it and the music is the audio version because yep. you can create something and if there aren't lyrics, then people kind of write their own story yep. to it. And so that's really neat. 
it's so cool to me how the process happens of like finding what we're good at and figuring out like how to duplicate something that's working. Yep. So you're talking about, you knew a buddy who connected you to like publishing and licensing. And then you started doing more of that because of being exposed to that side of the music business. So yep. was there like an aha moment where you're like, Hey, I could just do this. And that could be my thing. I feel like I'm still in that process of discernment. Cause it's okay. like, yeah, it's tricky. It's like the three bubbles. It's like, what are you good at? What are you going to get paid for? And what do you really feel called to do in that inner circle? Yeah. You want if that you can sweet find spot. That, it's like yes. Amazing. <laughs> um, and I, th I feel like different seasons you're in different areas of that really cultivating that. Um, but I've been now newly uh, father uh, we had our son my wife and I three months ago and so transitioning now to just like time management and like when I work I need to work when I'm home I need to be home yeah so it's like a whole new level of kind of finding what works and this year I'm really trying to try to focus on doing less so I can focus on like scaling some stuff and oh we are in that. the same so, season <laughs> of yes, life yes um when I became a parent as well it was the same thing of like how do I optimize my time and how do I focus in like shorter increments of time yeah. to actually get the most important things done um there's actually a book out there by Kate Northrup called do less and that is like my goal for 2020 that. is like to do less but to be more effective and um, yeah. If you've heard of the 80-20 rule, mm -hmm. we've talked about that on the show before, of like 20% of the work you're doing is responsible for 80% of your results. And so like nailing it down and figuring out what's the 20% that I'm doing yeah. and actually maximize what I'm doing. And so, uh, yeah, I think parenthood just really hones in on like- The microscope of- Efficiency, you know, <laughs> yeah, because time is so yeah. limited. So I totally understand that. And uh, I've been studying that as well of just- trying to figure out what's most important, what do I need to be doing? And um, as musicians too, I feel like if it's something that you love, like you mm -hmm. talked about, you could spend all your time just making the music yep. and just making it perfect, doing the best quality you can and just pouring everything into making it. But if nobody ever hears it, then it's like, what's the point? Because if you just, you know, have the result, yeah. but don't think, have an audience, job, then for sure. you gotta yeah, get it out there too. Yep, exactly. Um, and that's like kind of a whole other topic of discussion, like art for yeah. art's sake, or like <laughs> right. actually trying to make this into a career. Um, but it's interesting you brought up the 80-20 thing, because that's something I've, I've I've spent like the last month or so really reflect, reflecting on that and like, what do I need to be investing in this year? And um, sync licensing, I feel like opens up a really great opportunity for artists to like monetize their art other than touring and CD mm -hmm. sales. Yes. And so that's been awesome. like experience yeah. like it's a cool opportunity for people that do have kids that are trying to raise a family that need to be in town they can't just tour the whole world yep. and so this is a way to get your music out to the whole world without being there in person so and it's scalable which is yeah, nice like, yeah let's talk about this it's not connected to your time it's like um you're not trading your time for dollars anymore and so this yep. is a really cool business plan for musicians so let's yeah, talk about think, sync licensing and just like your experience with that um, as the artist pitching it and like the creating process mm. into, um, you know, who you're pitching it to. I'd love to hear yeah, more I'd about say like experience. the whole concept of, yeah, like music being your job, you're not going to love everything you create all the time where it's like your passion, like full on. Um, for me kind of, I mean, to be honest, like it's been a lot of my last couple of years, it's like investing in music that I, I definitely connect with, but there's like, like for specifically sync licensing, there is some formula. Like if you're yeah. a writer for um, commercial pitches or um, any other type of like artist placement stuff, there is a formula. And I think for me, I've like spent a while studying that. Um, but then within those like constraints, like figure out how to be as creative as you can. Um, for me, like I've always, um, yeah, there's like a form that works really well for like TV ad spots. But for me, I'm a string player first. so. I try to like take that formatting, but then I'll make it as organic and emotional kind of as possible with like live instruments and that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, so, so it's figuring have, out how to insert yourself kind of in that formula. <laughs> yeah. Is it multi-purpose in the formula or do you feel like each song kind of has its own purpose? Do you know what I mean? Like to be able yeah. to do both or does it need to be one or the other? I think you definitely kind of need, like if you're, if you're trying to land it for like, a spot it's helpful to have um i mean i feel like you can be more effective if you kind of 
visualize where it's going to go. And a lot of times I'll even do a bunch of kind of references. Um, yeah. I'm writing for a wedding film. I'll pull up like top 10 wedding filmmakers, kind of Smart. check out their videos, listen to kind of the dynamic structure, um, length. That's like a big thing. Um, Cause different platforms kind of have different mediums. Um, music bed, it's like a, now they have subscription, but it was a pay per like use. So if you give them a six minute song, it was the same price as paying for a two minute song. So there was an era where like longer songs were better for some filmmakers. Um, yeah, it kind of depends like uh, TV ad spot stuff. A lot of times it's like 30 seconds or 60 seconds. So even a more concise thing sometimes would help people like visualize how that fits into their, their spot. Um, yeah. So it's just doing a lot of research and mm -hmm. yeah, digging into the what's working, what's not for people. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up duration because you can actually use one song in different versions. Like you might have a good 30 second intro, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of comes comes in and then you got like the main part of the music and then it fades out in 30 seconds, like you said, so they can listen and imagine their commercial in that yep. amount of time because of like radio spots and, um, you know, constraints with that. But then if you want it to be like, in the background of a scene on TV, like you probably want it longer, right? You want it like yeah, minutes, for sure. And then they could pick and choose what parts of it they wanted. Exactly, and I think like the biggest thing I've had to learn because I've done a few custom scores where it's actually writing two pictures. So they send. If you haven't checked it out, the uh, Rocky version with no music on YouTube, it's like the craziest okay. thing because he's running up the stairs and he's doing all this stuff, but there's literally no music behind him. It's the most awkward thing. And I think yes. it shows the power of music in those moments, but and the power of acting. If you don't well, have too, the yeah. music video exactly. to like inspire it's the like acting, this integration of music with script with <laughs> what you see on on the screen and stuff. But I think it took me a while to learn this, but less is more. A lot of times when you're writing for stuff that's like kind of underbed, um, mm -hmm. you don't want to get too crazy melodically. Um, it's more of just kind of creating the mood and the experience that kind of gently moves you through. Um, for ad stuff, a lot of times that is more like hard hitting. You want it to kind of grab your attention a little bit more. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So as the writer, you're thinking about those things as you're creating it, doing your research, like you said, like even just searching similar things. Um, like if you wanted to pitch a song to Grey's Anatomy, let's say you yep. could watch Grey's Anatomy episodes, you could watch their credits and hear what kind of music they're playing and you can make something similar, like in a similar style. We're not copying people, definitely. Yeah. But um, if yeah, a lot you of know, times, like, oh, they always use a sad song right here and it's always slow. And so like, maybe even do some um, more internal research of like, okay, what's the beats per minute on this? And yeah. like, what are the swells like? And you know, there's other things that you can do that are similar, but it's not copying exactly. Yeah, a lot of times I like, even like down to, like you said, the BPM, the key and stuff, like you can manipulate some of that so it does become a new thing, but mm -hmm. it's still kind of hitting all the right tones. Yeah. Um, a lot of times when I'm working with filmmakers, um, I'll like speak more in like emotional kind of terms or even colors and then mm -hmm. figure out how that kind of inspires stuff. So you could even cool. like listen to consistently like five wedding filmmaker videos and what type of moods do those in inspire. And then that can, you even grab their BPM consistently um, but change keys and kind of let the the words and descriptors kind of inspire you. I think you'll end up in a new creation, but it's still the right kind of vibe for what they're looking for. Yeah, I think having some direction and like a framework to use really helps so you don't have like that writer's block of yeah. like r making something from nothing. You have mm -hmm. some kind of start and then the creativity comes in with how do I make it my own? How do I yep. make it different? How do I express what I'm feeling in a new way? Yep. And so that's the exciting part as a creative musician of like creating something that ha hasn't been done before this way. I really so, like that. Yeah, and I think, um, so I, I produce a lot of uh, first time Christian artists too. And like, I had to learn this too as like a writer and creator and someone who records stuff. Uh, when you're first starting, like if you're intentionally seeking out to write for TV and film, just do a bunch of it. Like it's gonna be, it doesn't yeah. have to be the perfect creation within that thing. It's like a snapshot kind of where you're at in time. Um, especially yeah, if you are working towards like being able to write quickly for doing some like more custom stuff or bigger scores, like you have to put a ton of 
songs under your belt before you can actually get to a place where it's like coming really naturally and you can work within constraints but be fully creative mm -hmm. so you're gonna write a lot of bad awkward cues before <laughs> you write ones that are like yeah great yeah also. it's that practice and yeah. just getting it in and getting more comfortable with it just like playing an instrument you have yep. to play it a ton before you're actually really good and then you know after you've been playing for 10,000 hours is what yeah. the uh, level of mastery rule of thumb is mm -hmm. once you've been playing that long then you can like pick it up and just play something amazing people are like wow you're so talented yep. and you can say yeah i'm talented after 10,000 <laughs> hours um yeah and it, people of average talent can do really well after 10,000 hours of something um yeah. so really i think there's a place like we said the sweet spot earlier there's a place where talent meets skill meets practice and like the mm -hmm. hard work of doing something over and over is how you get good at something exactly. so that's the same in songwriting and and I'm sure with uh, with recording and any other skill, like it just takes that repetition. Yep, habit building. That's like part of my goal this year is like develop yes. more good consistent habits. So. And then you have to um, think about it less. So anytime you start something, you have to think about it a lot more. But then mm -hmm. it just gets easier and easier as it becomes a habit. Exactly. So. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So I've got a couple more questions for you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned working with a licensing company. So how does that work when you've created the music, it's recorded, you've got the files. Do you have some kind of contract with them or like a list of things they're looking for and then you send it to your contact? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's just relationship building. Um, specifically with Musicbed, I feel like I was lucky and got in kind of right before they got pretty strict. Like I think now they have absurd amounts of like daily submissions and i think they're like probably accepting like under like 0, 0.0 something percent of people like it's very very small number sure of but there's other companies that oh yeah there's a ton that of other do that so exactly um so i think it's just finding the right fit for you and like if you can kind of be with an organization from the ground up like you said there's like so many new companies coming up um i think even cd baby and um a few other places have spots where you can like opt in and and they'll actually start pitching. But I'd say yeah. be a little bit careful, just making sure it's gonna be an organization that is gonna actually help get your music and they believe in your music out there. Um, Cause I've had a few songs placed in places that it was just not the right fit. Um, in terms of like logistics, when you're like signing to a company, I think as much control as you can keep, even your publishing, um, try to yeah, maintain on your copyright and try not to go fully exclusive so that you can work with different people write with different people because so i think yeah like as a creative i enjoy writing many different genres and they work differently in different spots so if i was all in one basket like i'm not going to be able to be as fully expansive kind of with my creativity and be successful so that um, advice is gold in so yeah. many ways i mean that as a songwriter i mean you have to you know, keep enough rights to your music so you can use it in other places. And there are times when you want to, you know, do splits and things like that, and it can be negotiated, but you never want to give it all away. You know? Yeah, and I'd say like, be fair, like for me, like when I collaborate and write on a song, it's always just even split. Like I, I, I'm fair to the people who I'm can, like wanting to build that relationship and work with. Yeah. But definitely don't let a big company push you around because um, as a creative, like you deserve right to your copyright, so. Yeah, always read the fine print. Yes. <laughs> always want to do exactly. that before you agree to something yep. and say, oh yeah, take my music, use it however you want. You know, and you want to make sure they're using are, it to get paid. Yep. And a lot of people are actively like kind of reaching out to, hey, be a part of this. Um, just because it looks shiny on the outside, like time is your friend. So you don't have to sign the dotted line right now. I take the, the week to really think through it and making sure it's the right fit and ask around, so. So good. Well, I have a slightly off topic question for you. Uh, we recently had an episode on the podcast about pitching songs to Spotify playlists. And oh, cool. I know that your music is on Spotify. You've got a lot of instrumental music, so it gets on instrumental playlists and stuff. Do you have a certain strategy for either when you're writing or when you're putting music out to pitching it to playlists? Because I think that's something artists can do, even if they don't have a connection to a licensing company right now. Yep. They can Definitely. get their own music out there. So what do you do with that? Yeah, Spotify really opened up their platform to like do your own personal submission to the big playlists. Um, I've actually spent a lot more time kind of in the Christian realm. 
um because i yeah, produce a bunch of different christian artists and okay. they're typically the ones i'm pushing this year i am hoping to um kind of scale back on the number of artists i'm producing so i can focus on my own art and craft but um i think there are some like good standards for playlist pitching via spotify specifically um things that i've learned is like they do want to see kind of what happens in that first week so upon release of stuff like if you can get on a bunch of like user generated playlists get a bunch of people to like actually stream it within that first week like get your your little posse to like hit play repeat it um it's really just like what happens in that first week that gets spotify's attention to then potentially add it to bigger playlists um and then i'd say yeah don't undervalue i think the smaller playlist um i started doing some curation stuff for different playlists I manage and uh, a few of the artists that we've added them to our thing like we have some pretty active listeners and so even if there's like 300 people following a playlist like that can really gain up or add up like your stream count um, so I'd say get on as many of those as you can um, even if you do like some like pre-landing page on your website or wherever and like send that out to all your people um, before the release happens um, just be like hey when this drops this day be sure to add it and that'll really help kind of increase your odds for landing like a bigger playlist. So. Awesome. Really good advice on that. I appreciate it. That's kind of yeah. a different angle than what we talked about before um, because this is like preparing to release. And so you kind of got uh, time working for you at, the, at yeah. the beginning that first week, you know, once it's released, you can still pitch it out to playlists and get yep. on playlists and stuff. Um, but Have you guys talked about like HubSpot or some of those other offline no, Others. have you used that? I've tried it a couple times. I've been kind of not successful with it, but um, I am kind of diving more into that realm. And it's like a way that you can buy credits and pitch to blogs, playlists. Um, a lot of my success has actually been with this um, composer, Philip Daniel. He's a pianist. And so he's like way more in that world. So we've gotten on a couple of big plot blogs. Um, I think NPR did like a little feature on one of our songs, which was really cool. Um, so it's just, yeah getting it out there in all mediums yeah, um, that'll help push people to Spotify. So awesome. Isn't it amazing how one song can just go huge yeah. <laughs> and just, I mean, it's like always it's, the random song. You're like, this one's going to do great. Yeah. That, that was actually my first yeah, record. I, did so with true. Music Bed. I added this like last minute song that I was like, okay, I'm just going to write another one. And, and that's was, the one they loved. Yeah. It's been a day yeah. recording, but that was the one that got picked up for like this, the Ford commercial, which is crazy. That's always how it goes. That's so <laughs> funny. I've heard that from so many artists, like, really? This song is yeah, the exactly. one that like gets to be a hit or gets to be a cut. And you're like, I did not yeah. see that coming. And then the song that you've like poured your heart into and you're like, this could be the best song ever. 50 you're streams. Like, you're like, Crickets. <laughs> and it's crazy how that works. But yeah, I mean, all it takes is one song. And so I feel like uh, this could be one of those habit forming things of like every time you do a release have like a strategy of getting it yep. onto playlists or every time you um have a song coming out like have this plan because you never know which one is going to really pop and yep. get out one there. other key thing for spotify too is to make sure you're uploading it to your like distributor distro kid cd baby tune core at least like a month in advance yeah there's been a few releases where i'm like oh the week before upload it um you need it you need to give it time to actually populate um, yes, then they can actually view it, so, yeah. And that's something a lot of musicians don't do is they put Free. it out there last minute, but yeah. if you plan ahead, yeah. you're definitely ahead of the game. And like you said, it gives time for Spotify to get it on their editorial playlist and exactly. you can really give it a good push for the first release and for the first week that it's out. Yep. So that is awesome. Thanks so much, Sean, for being yeah. on the show today, sharing some of your story and some awesome tips for songwriters and advice. Uh, for anyone who's interested in pitching their songs for sync licensing, I think this is a great option for musicians, uh, even if you're not the artist. If you um, have written songs and have other people record it, even you could promote it um, as an artist. So there's just so many opportunities out there. Um, tell us where we can find your music online. Yeah, so if you go to musicbyshawnwilliams.com and Sean's S-H-A-W-N, um, I have a links, yeah, different links to all my um, profiles awesome. and stuff so and when they go to music by sean williams.com and they listen to your music what song do you want to recommend oh, to listen to from your 
we actually ha- I have some new stuff coming out that will probably be out by the time this drops. So oh, and new <laughs> stuff. All right. Yeah. So go to the website to hear the newest from Sean Williams. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this interview of the Rustic Songbird podcast. And again, I want to invite you to register for my free class for musicians called The Three Secrets to Planning a Successful Album Release. You can sign up and grab your free spot at rusticsongbird.com forward slash register. I'll see you there.